right, everybody, welcome to another OpenShift Commons Transformation Friday. Um, and today um, we're going to talk about um, something that's near and too dear to my, my heart uh, around open source collaboration. And we have with us Emma Irwin from the Open Source Program Office at Microsoft, formerly from, uh, from Mozilla. And um, what started this conversation was a blog post she worked, she wrote and posted um, back in early September around weaving safety into the fabric of open source collaboration. And if you know me, um, a lot of the work that, that I've been doing around OpenShift Commons is trying to create um, spaces and give away the podium and make sure we have inclusive communities here at Red Hat and in the CNCF and other arenas and foundations where we work. And Mozilla and Microsoft have been, you know, places where uh, we've touched and interacted with and collaborated with in the past. And the work that Emma's done has been um, instrumental in bringing some of this, um, this conversation to light and to making sure that we have um, some good pieces of uh, documentation and good practices for um, open participation. But safety is always um, an interesting topic. Um, and I'm just going to have Emma talk a little bit about um, the gist of what was in her blog post um, and maybe for 10 minutes or so from the comfort of her car where she's stationed right now um, and in doing all that. And so, Emma, how about if you introduce yourself, give us a little bit about your background, how you came to Mozilla, how you ended up um, over at, lovely working over at Microsoft now. And um, we'll just talk for about 10 minutes maybe, and then we'll have a, a conversation about this topic. Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me, Diane. It's a real um, honor to be here and to be talking about this um, particular topic. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. And um, yeah, so um, hi, I'm Emma. I, um, as you mentioned, started um, kind of this journey around the, our topic area at Mozilla, but I've been a part of open source for probably 15 to 20 years. I started off my career as an engineer, so um, I really just followed my Kind of curiosity around how things were made and 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 um, as I became more advanced in my career and hit kind of those glass ceilings, um, I really looked to open source as a way to um, learn more skills that I maybe didn't have the opportunity to. Um, my like people specifically, I, I always mentioned Angie Byron from the Drupal community was someone that inspired me early on that I was able to go into communities and learn and and um, build new things was really cool. So open source really was a venue for me early on as an engineer. And as I became like more um, enamored as part of that experience, I started to also teach others how to get involved. So um, that became sort of my my transition to um, Mozilla in empowering others to be successful in open source projects. Um, of course, the the, um, the thing that became really central to my work, uh, especially around diversity, equity, inclusion in Mozilla was, you know, how do we make sure that open source is actually open? And for me, that means that it's actually inclusive because you cannot decouple inclusion and open that for me, they're the same thing. Uh, and so I, you know, worked on community and open source at Mozilla for a number of years and had the opportunity during that time to also witness, witness the transition of organizations uh, like Microsoft, um, who started to have open source program offices who started to invest in open source and recognize their ability to change the world and innovate. Uh, I became, uh, I really saw the transition, especially for Microsoft in that space. And with the, when they hired Stormy uh, Peters a, a year or so ago, I really started to pay attention and that became, you know, um, kind of the next place I wanted to, to be and to, to contribute. And I'm was lucky enough to, to have that opportunity just starting recently. So, and uh, that's how I got to where I am now. So one of the things that you focused on in, in this article that really struck me was um, this concept about um, why people who are participating need to feel um, safe and supported and empowered in their roles. I, you know, I love that the line there and sort of the four areas there. And if you can talk a little bit maybe about these four areas um, and how you how, how you see that um, being playing out and what guidance and support you can we can as community managers and OSPOs and places can um, what we can mm -hmm. do to ensure that we we are delivering on these promises. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, like maybe historically or in the beginning in open thought about enforcing our acts or at Mozilla, Mozilla's case enforcing their community participation guidelines was sort of fell on the shoulders of the community manager or like whoever happened to be at the helm of you know, a maintainer role. Um, and, and something that I started to see was that actually this was an unfair burden basically on those people, especially if they weren't experienced in open source or the, um, you know, there's things they hadn't, um, you know, you, you hadn't, don't learn necessarily in engineering how to, for example, help someone who's threatening self-harm. Like that just isn't part of engineering uh, 101 and maybe it, it should be, but, um, and so I started to have conversations uh, across the organization. This is really, I guess, to answer your question is that I think partnerships are key in organizations. And when I say partnerships, I mean like, you know, the engineering is talking to HR and HR is talking to legal and, and you know, there's this, this circle of, of understanding about what the problems are that, that staff are facing and of course, contributors and community are facing. And then to, to strategize how we might best solve those things together. So safety is, is so these are the, the, the four areas of risk that we identified were safety, privacy, legal and brand. And in some ways it felt kind of like, the empathy seemed to be missing by categorizing them as risk, but actually that's a really, I found that was actually very, very um, empathetic to think about the, the ways that people might be harmed and the organization as a term might be harmed. So safety is definitely, you know, whether we're in our physical spaces or online, like safety uh, and that's psychological perceived or otherwise, right? So sometimes people get caught up in, oh, is that actually gonna happen? Are they really gonna get dogs? Is that, but um, you know, so that's a part of safety as well. Privacy, of course, in um, when we're, you know, taking reports from people or we're storing data, you know, so it's like data classification and, you know, like privacy is something that that um, permeates all the different areas of work. Legal, of course, is, you know, applicable laws. For example, um, you, you can't have, you can't report sexual um, uh, harassment, uh, in a digital format in India. Like there's like these really like interesting laws and, and, and also anonymous reporting is not allowed in somewhere like Denmark. So understanding all these different things that can um, be risky is the legal category. And of course, brand is like, you know, if you're not handling, you know, your complaints and you're not supporting your staff, well, they might just take that narrative outside your organization. And that's, you know, a huge brand risk and, you know, um, hurtful to the, the people that are actually doing a really great job within those organizations. Find it in, um... In, in conversations internally with companies, that brand is usually the thing that um, that comes up and that's the thing that onboards them into paying attention to this um, space. You know, it's like if they think awesome. something, if something <laughs> goes awry, um, it's yeah. going to reflect badly on, on your brand and then you can get your corporate management and other teams um, involved in, in be doing better partnering, better education. You touched on something earlier too about um, the role that we normally in open source projects, the role of the community manager, especially in the past, historically, and it's still true for a lot of projects. It um, lands yeah. on the maintainers, the folks who are leading the project and the engineers. And I think what we're seeing in the arc of open source um, community development is this understanding that the maintainers maintain um, and that for the most part, if they're maintaining from an engineering perspective, um, doing code contribution, you know, roadmaps and, you know, figuring out the technology innovation, that there's a new role that's sort of emerging, uh, I think now in projects where um, non-engineers are becoming part of steering committees um, to, to be bring in new mechanisms to the projects um, to allow for, end user participation, um, the folks who, that are doing community developments to have a voice in what is the management of the community side, maybe not so much the code side. So I think in addition to all of the partnerships, are you, are you seeing this as well over at Microsoft and at Mozilla, this sort of changing of the guard of who is in charge of community or who is um, responsible for making this new people coming in? Yeah. Um... So I, I think definitely involving all, you know, um, I do see the transition in open source more broadly at, at Mozilla and I'm starting to learn at Microsoft, so I can't speak too, too much there yet, but 
that there is this like empowerment of all you know all backgrounds and all um all, all contributions like yeah. that's what you're getting at i think that there are different uh, roles for people in an open source project and that recognizing the importance of other roles we talk a lot about like the easiest way to get a contribution um is yeah. you know, maybe to to onboard to write documentation um yeah. but we also now are seeing and i talk about this extensively in, in other places um the rise of end users participating side by side um, in open source projects. I was just talking with yeah. the metal cubed folks and um, though it may have sprung from the head of Red Hat, um, uh, like out of some whatever vendors head and got put into a, a, the sandbox over in CNCF. It's now really um, folks from Ericsson, an end user community that um, that are that's driving that project. So yeah. the engineers so you have this other thing too that's happening, I think, um, around um, who's participating and the brand piece of this, which I, for some reason, I'm stuck in my head right now on that, yep. um, is that not only is it our brand, but now that our where our communities are so closely tied with our end users customers, we have to yep. even make more of a focus on making sure that our communities are um, open and inclusive and uh, we don't ha mishandle or worse off not handle um, yeah. uh, any issues that might arise because that could be you know simply the easiest way to lose a customer um, yeah. as well not only just this so I think one of the things I, I, that has been a challenge for me is getting and it shouldn't be it isn't really at Red Hat but at lots of other startups and places that I have worked at getting mm -hmm. the company on board at resourcing this aspect of community management yeah um 100 to everything you just said um and i know especially at microsoft like you know putting developers first and our users first is is, is central so um 100 to everything you just said and and that building those safe and inclusive places of course directly aligns with that like 100 what you just said um I think I think the I mean I think if the question is how do we get organizations to recognize that um, I definitely like I found that was one of my biggest challenges at at Mozilla initially was think it's important for people to be safe right no matter what their role in the open source part like everyone will nod and say like it's important that you know everyone feel safe and feel inclusive you know like that's kind of hard to get and what it, what is hard to get sometimes is like you know, those parts when an organization or company to go, oh, that's that's me that should own that, right? Or that's, you know, or that this isn't something that can just be like a nice intention, but it has to have, you know, for example, safety at Mozilla, like we had a, you know, a safety group that didn't have a DR, DRI, like a directly responsible individual for a little like, little while. And so what that meant was, you know, like, yes, there's all the like people, you know, from info security and HR and, and that, that were, had the skills and capabilities to support somebody who was, you know, in some way threatened. But, with, you know, if it happened on a Saturday, <laughs> for example, right, like without a DRI, then, you know, um, then there was a chance. I mean, it didn't, you know, it didn't happen, but there was a chance that, you know, we might fail someone. So I think storytelling is probably an important part of that, you know, um, getting people to recognize that sometimes things actually have to happen, unfortunately. <laughs> To, to, to change um, those hearts and minds, but um, so I, I yeah, yeah you touched, my journey. <laughs> you, you touched on a, a, a part of it too that's actually interesting to me is um, the HR side of this. So um, yep. in the past, I've been like in open source events or just tech events. Um, there's been these huge con uh, conversations around codes of conduct um, and mm -hmm. because you can put a code of conduct up there. On, on your yep. page and have these wonderful words. But um, I one of the conversations I've, I've had in the past is that don't put it up there unless you can act on it, right? Like unless yep. you let the DRI piece that you're referring to, but if, if it's just words on a page and someone, yep. and there's no person who's gonna take responsibility or action or follow up on it with the right skill set, then that's almost worse than, um, than, than nothing, right? Yeah, it's, it's super dangerous. I mean, I, I did a I did a survey in 2017 that kind of informed some of this work. And one of the questions that I asked was, and we surveyed over 240 different open source projects, um, and we had like 
75% of those who opted into the survey were themselves in underrepresented groups. So we felt like did a good segment. We just asked a simple question like, do you think the code of conduct in your community is enforced? Um, and, you know, do you trust? And we saw, you know, even among those, you know, like just generally speaking, only 50% of people thought their code of conduct was, you know, enforced effectively. And effectively is kind of a word that I maybe would have changed, but anyways. Um, and then of those who were underrepresented, it rose to like, you know, 76% didn't believe it was. So, um, you know, whether it actually was, you know, the fact that that many people, and this is 2017, so I'm hoping that that has changed since then, you know, didn't have that confidence is is alarming, right? And and to your point, yeah, that I think it's great that a lot of people threw up code of conducts when, you know, but the enforcement piece is really critical. And to your point, having it there and not enforcing it is actually dangerous for yeah. folks. Yeah, I've seen, a, 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 you know, and I've probably been guilty of it in the past too, is it, until I, till, till someone called up on the phone and said, this happened to me, and then it was on me to figure out how to do that as the person who was hosting the event. Um, so that was, you know, that's been, that was a bit of an eye opener <clears throat> too for me. Yeah. And enrolling the, I think the success fast factor for us was enrolling a partnership with HR um, and yes. making sure that cool. like whether it was us, um, the, the event organizer or the community manager organizer um, or a development person um, having having prior to the event or prior for the launching of, of the community, a conversation with HR about what will we do if someone reports, right? And that yeah. I think um, that the, the workflow even to get it down to breaking that down. So, so if, if we put an email here, who is going to answer it? Who is doing that? And I, and I think since 2017, we, I mean, probably a little bit prior to that, we've seen um, the HR involvement and the ensuring that there is like a, you were talking about the safety committee, there is a group who are on standby um, for if this happens, hopefully nothing happens, but there is actually a, a body there. I think that is yeah. um, one of the, the key things I think that was it. And the other part that has always been an interesting conversation is working with our corporate legal teams, because then there's, yeah. you're, you're taking responsibility for ensuring the safety and that that maybe it's that word ensuring right that you will you're yeah. taking responsibility for it and for companies um, and organizations whether they're um, vendors like us that put on these events or CNCF foundations and Linux foundations mm -hmm. that put on these things or Mozilla um, that's we kind of understand that um, not all of us but most of us understand we're taking that responsibility on. But now as we see more end user organizations and corporations coming on to that, um, maybe they're not the size of Apple or Salesforce, they're smaller companies that are coming in and creating open source projects. Um, they might not have had this conversation yet with their legal or their HR team. And so everybody is at different stages in the spectrum. And as we see this, what I keep, referring to as this huge rise of end users. You know, if you look at um, Uber donating Lyft and Lyft donating code to the CNCF or Envoy or Open Tracing and Jaeger or um, Spotify, some of these are newer companies. So they hopefully um, and come out of the startup Silicon Valley point of view, but there are some stuff that's coming from older companies, telcos and stuff like that, where they don't have um, perhaps as strong of as an OSPO um, culture or support network internally to the company. And you see this, I see this now in the rise of um, open source uh, program offices or things similarly named inside of our end users and, and um, companies as part of, almost as part of the digital transformation arc, you know, the, as they get yeah. better at being, taking on all of this stuff, what we're also bringing to them is this culture and this stru these structures for um, doing more participation in open source. And so that's been yeah. part of a lot of things. Can you speak a little bit to what you've seen in that space? Um, so it, just one, one thing, if you, if you scroll down this blog post, there's like three circles, there's like two green and one gray, and that'll help me speak to something a little bit later. Um, I think, I mean, I think if I understand your question, it's really about, getting those partnerships to happen is that is that the yeah like what what should people be doing inside of their the internal part yeah okay um so 
I'll just say like aside, I think it'd be amazing at some point if organizations like Mozilla and Red Hat and, and others should get together and produce data. Cause I mean, of course there's nothing like data to get yeah. people to get on board, right? So initially when I worked on the, um, on our HR partnership in, internally to Mozilla, you know, what I brought them was like a year's worth of data to talk about, okay, so here's how many cases we've handled as like the community focused team. Here's how many of those were staff requesting support, right? So they're staff going, you know, normally I can deal with this, but I don't know how to deal with somebody who's threatening self harm, you know, or this person's getting into my DMs and being really cre creepy. I don't know how to, you know, like really like themselves reporting actually, right? Like there's not always this recognition that the community managers felt like they were trying to solve other people's problems, but at the same time, they're also experiencing, you know, different levels of trauma or upset. And so um, I brought that data, like it was something like 55% of the people reporting are staff, right? So that's, that's a number that HR and, and, you know, HR, your role is to support staff. So that was really um, sort of helpful in the narrative. And I give a couple stories about what, what those types of, how those played out. So I think that that approach is really good. If you don't have data yet, then this is why I was thinking at some point, it'd be awesome if, multiple organizations could get together and, and do some of that storytelling. Maybe we're at a threshold now where, you know, the, the, the privacy of those folks involved wouldn't be threatened, of course. But anyways, that, that maybe that's a little bit of, I've, I've heard that um, in our, we have a DNI and open source telegram channel that folks are also more than welcome to join. It's like a bunch of different open source communities if you're not already part of it. And that is something that's come across. So, you know, um, so to get those partnerships, definitely data, definitely showing what other organizations are doing. And you know, one mistake that I made or that I found was a little bit didn't work is trying to make it like call it a strategic partnership or make it sound like a really weighty thing that someone had to add to their workload. Instead, something like these the three circles um, that I've that are on the screen here, breaking down like what each department needs to say yes, <laughs> right? It doesn't have to be in like a, a big set of OKRs or something. And so this was, you know. Um, employee support, you know, is going to cover that, you know, if an employee reports that they're going to acknowledge the experience, they'll talk to their manager, the manager might need coaching, you know, let the employee know what they'll do and, and um, they'll resource for support. Um, and they'll also invest, uh, you know, cover the investigation. That's actually a whole skill set, right? Like, you know, we can go and look into things, but I've discovered, you know, there's a whole probably set of talented people in your organization that were trained in investigation. So that's also something <laughs> that, that um, I propose the um, HR department um, did. And then offering our support uh, as far as the community team or those focused on external contributors, it's like, you know, we can work on system, disabling systems, communication, we have templates, we have like our consequence ladder, which shows, you know, how you can assign a, a consequence and really like making them feel supported at the same time as asking them for support, I think is critical. And then again, just not making it sound like a, a big weighty thing that's gonna, you know, because especially I think in the current uh, economy and everything, you know, making it sound like you need resources is just like a bad idea altogether. So um, that would be my advice. <laughs> I think it's, an, it's interesting too, because um, you and I have probably both been in community management and community development for a long time. Um, and mm -hmm. I think both of us were previously software engineers on other projects, but we didn't um, maybe, um, and most of us who are engineers, when someone in community management says, oh, we need to put this into place, it, it on top of your engineering role, um, yeah. that's also like a huge ask. So it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting, it's like balancing it out. And these, these systems pretty much inside of every company should exist already. There are experts yeah. in this um, at your company somewhere. And so, yeah. and, but I think that like for a lot of um, new projects, it's the beginning awareness that this is, has to be part of their thought process too. So um, the beginning awareness. Sure. Yeah. So a lot of um, the focus that um, we see in new projects that um, that arise and in, in there are like um, you know a million plus GitHub repos popping up um, now out there, and so every new thing is we we tell them they need to have a license in place. You know, pick pick your license. You know have mm -hmm. some open governance, you know, do these, you know, make sure you have a, a contribution ladder so people know how to become, what the road is from newbie to maintainer, make like yeah. all of these things. And we're really good at that. And like, um, I give a huge shout out to the CNCF's contributor um, strategy SIG and Paris Pittman and Stephen Augustus and Josh Burkus are doing great work around that. 
But this yeah. is another aspect that we're putting on open source projects, um, mm -hmm. especially, uh, you know, and part of the reason there, there is a benefit to joining a foundation because they yeah. have this infrastructure in place and they can add that to um, your, your processes. So the burden isn't on the, um, the engineers or the maintainers or, you know, the people who are the end users of these things. Um, so, you know, I, I might not have been always the most vociferous supporter of foundations in the past. I think yeah. people who listen to me might hear me rant and rave about that, but the price that we as vendors um, pay for memberships and everything else supports um, bringing that, this so, these sorts of um, infrastructure and support systems to your projects. So yeah. that's another aspect that people don't really think about what foundations are bringing. So um, I, yeah. you know, and kudos to them for doing that. And then, so if you're in a, in a foundation, look to that foundation to see what their processes are. Um, if you're in a large company, um, or even a small one, talk to your HR folks um, and find out what already is pre-existing um, and what they can help you yeah. with. So yeah. Um, yeah, my, my focus employment, is, go ahead. Employment legal is a big one too. Sorry, employment legal, I just add on to HR is, was one of my biggest allies in, in telling that story. Yeah, I think that here at Red Hat, we have some amazing uh, Richard Fontana and a whole bunch of other folks in the um, the Red Hat legal department that have years and years of experience um, with these things. Yeah. Um, and not so much with this side of it, but with all of the legal stuff and their, they, they, the storytelling that they could do after, you know, some of these people have been in these in this game at Mozilla and Red Hat and IBM and Microsoft and other, other places. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of experience. So you don't, you're not, you're not reinventing the wheel here. And I, that's, I think what I thought yeah. was so nice about this blog post was it really kind of mapped out um, where we, you know, where we were coming from, what, what we could do. And, and, and perhaps um, uh, you talked a, a little bit about um, in the blog post about the program for enforcement that you guys put in place. Um, how, what did that take to actually do create that? And I think I'm talking about the PPG program enforcement section here. That was the other right. thing. Right. Yeah, um, I'll just add on to your, your uh, sorry, I'll just quickly add on to your comment about foundation. So um, just mentioning the chaos uh, project, which is a, a project of the Linux foundation and a lot of um, the, the DNI metrics, um, were deeply rooted in some of my research. So the, the um, if you're looking for metrics around code of conduct enforcement or even assessing your code of conduct that, that you can go to the chaos project um, and, and look there, you'll find, I, there's like even a tool we built to, to look through. Um, anyway, so that's to your point. Yeah, foundations are doing great work. <laughs> the chaos um, folks are, are absolutely awesome. Looking at community health and helping um, build out um, best practices and share lessons learned and actually create metrics around community health that can yeah. help with this, this, these pieces of the, of the puzzle that is there. Yeah. And, and I think that was kind of where I was moving with your, um, the program that you, yeah. you built out. So maybe I'll slide yeah. down to that and so you can talk yeah. about, a little bit about what yeah, you did. So it, I mean, it really, it was, it's, it was kind of um, cool. <laughs> I'm not sure the right word, but when we really step back, back at the end of this viewing over the last two years was building a program. It was very much like piece by piece. And so, um, you know, the components of the program, our enforcement program were, you know, policy, um, obviously, but, and, and, you know, by policy, you know, we're talking about standards, like a code of conduct or our community participation guideline itself are, you know, standards and policy. And, and um, not just that, you know, we in a corner of the project or a corner of the organization say matters, but that others recognize so that, you know, the fact that we have a consequence ladder that the HR department is also using when they are making recommendations, you know, that's a policy that's like uh, in place. Um, the, the code of conduct itself is a policy and we make that, uh, what's the word? Um, relevant by constantly updating it. So last year we added CAS to that after we, um, you know, talked to somebody, um, uh, for, forgetting the organization name, but, you know, that basically opened our eyes to the fact that CAS discrimination was a thing that happens, you know, in open source communities and what that looks like. So we added that. So always updating this policy. Internal partnerships, uh, you know, uh, 
mostly informal, as I mentioned with HR, but just the deliberate, the, those partnerships are key. So that's legal, that's working with safety, that's working with um, workplace resources. So I don't know if the, what that's called in other organizations, but you know, people who work in offices and run events, you know, having partnerships with those folks. So for example, if you have someone that has been banned from your communities that turns up an event, you know, having that partnership, make sure that that is stopped in its tracks. Um, we have two different working groups speaking of tracking data. The first uh, was actually merging the records of HR, uh, the, community, the community records for violations of enforcement and legal, and um, making those, not the records themselves accessible, but making sure that we weren't giving MOS grants or hiring people or giving leadership roles to people who might have been you know, banned from the community. Something we recognized early on was that we had scattered records. And so it was actually possible for a while that you know, somebody might get hired that being banned from the community. So we have a working group that accepts um, requests to review those names, almost like a background check, but for community, which didn't exist before. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, yeah. I mean, but it's not like- moving because people, re in this, uh, uh, how do you deal with um, people rehabilitating themselves or, you know, yeah. bring, there, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot that must go on in that community um, working group. Yeah, yeah. And so under, like, uh, speaking of bringing people back, that would fall in our policy. We do have, like, on our consequence ladder, we have temporary ban. I think it's level five or six. And we have a process uh, CPG onboarding, which is where, you know, people are offered to come, we offer to bring them back where there's own where they have to have a conversation we set them up for success it's very positively oriented but also might have some restrictions and so we do we, we did have a policy for that which is about a 50 50 success rate the <laughs> last time that um i checked it so the other working group is safety so we have folks you know if someone's being doxxed or someone you know feels unsafe or like we have infosec and hr and legal and uh, workplace resources and all, all like the, the C-level people and, and, you know, VPs on that so that, you know, someone emails that we can act quickly. That's the other working group. Education, we have two courses which have actually been really critical. The first is for staff and it just covers, it's like a first aid course for enforcement. So it's not like teaching people to be very, you know, to know all the things that I might know or you might know, but that they know, okay, this is what how you take a report and you don't try and get someone to change their story and you you know, you make sure that the data is like labeled confidential and there's all these different steps and then, you know, what to expect and um, yeah, and the, their role. So it's very, very first aid. We even have like infographic, what to do by, by P1, P2, P3, P4. You report it, you tell your manager, like it's something they can print and put on their wall. Uh, and we had 80 or 88% of our community facing staff and their managers took that course last year. So that was a huge win that everyone walking around knows what their responsibility is and what to do. And then on the community side, we also had um, a training course that mirrored that, but it was for community managers, uh, for non-staff community managers and maintainers and that sort of thing. So they also knew, hey, we have your back, right? And here's what you can expect. And here's who you can call. And, um, and so that's just starting to roll out. That was behind the staff one. And that's going to be part of all community onboarding. So that institutional knowledge is super important. You know, you can't have, like if a community manager leaves and we have someone new join, we need to make sure that they're not having to learn by fire again, right? <laughs> that they are immediately like, here's the course that will tell you how you're supported. And so I think that education has been really important. You know, systems are just, you know, tools that help us move faster. So we have a, uh, a C, um, sorry, a, um, LMS for delivering that content and a hotline for taking reports digitally, although most come in kind of verbally, they don't, we don't get a lot more, more spam through the system. Yeah. And then we really just talk about our customers and users like we would any other service, right? And, and it, I think I even write that it feels, you know, calling people in distress or who need help customers, but it really helps us think about what they need and what, you know, we can provide. And so, you know, at Mozilla, we, this program has serviced pretty much every project and product in a company from Firefox to hubs to, you know, MDN and that, you know, non-technical uh, folks, uh, you know, technical writers, engineers, uh, in person at, you know, Mozilla All Hands, we've, we've covered things that have happened in, in a lot of different areas and um, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. the program. And of course it's always evolving, right? You, yeah. you know, it's never yeah. done, yeah, but it's a one of the things about Mozilla that I, I, I loved over the years is really you have been sort of at the forefront of making sure these like 
not only in technology but also in community development and making making this stuff available and and accessible and almost all of what you've talked about is in Mozilla's um, template and you know not all of it but a lot of it is there and the reusability of it I think is something that um, as long as it's again going back to the the old co code of conduct that has no ba nothing backing it up just copying it from the template yeah. isn't enough it's but yeah. it it's a, a good place to start educating your um, your your companies and other folks that, that you know that the work that you guys have done. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about. I know you've only been at Microsoft for a very short time, uh, and and you did take you did take and Microsoft did bring Stormy Peters over, so um, we know you're gonna get a lot of um, you're gonna have a great time with her as as an ex Red yeah. Hat Mozilla person. So she's yeah. you know, she's she's one of our um, you know open source community heroes um, yeah. or sheroes or whatever. Um, yeah. But I think, uh, how how does this play out in your new role over at Microsoft? And how are you gonna take this to the next level? Um, and Microsoft, I'm not saying that they don't have this in place. They do have a lot yeah. of this already mm -hmm. in place. So it's just stepping up the game. Where do you think the road ahead is for this? Yeah, um, so yeah, so it's my third, I just was my third uh, week at Microsoft, but I, I, and I'm doing a lot of learning around like, how does, you know, what I just built it at Mozilla, like where does that fit in Microsoft or what are they doing that is also this, I guess is is something that I've answered. And I've been, you know, super impressed by the fact that internally there's, you know, um, open source champ. So there's across the organization, which is really big. <laughs> I, I thought Mozilla, you know, um, there's lots of people who care about open source and the, their, like your, to your point, the users of their open source, um, uh, software and just the, the the ecosystem overall. So um, the program the, the program isn't quite like this, but there is this intention across the organization that is really remarkable. And I feel like uh, everything is being handled really well there already. I have to get kind of my hooks into like exactly how it functions, but from what I can see, it's well in hand as far as safety goes. And that is in law, and that there's some merging culture there that really values um, values the outcome of what they're building for their customers and users, but also for the the broader ecosystem. So the the partners that they have, you know, we're part of the Next Foundation, you know, to do group and working with other. I think it's probably one of the the more remarkable things that I see happening. And so while Mozilla at Mozilla, we had to build this program for enforcement, I see it those partnerships as being at a whole, really they're leveraging each other's expertise, you know, outside of the organization. And I think it's really exciting to follow how OSPOs are working together uh, on some of these problems. And, and like, I, I personally had been doing that anyways, because it was like, wow, like who would have thought, you know, like Uber and, you know, um, and sales, Salesforce. Everybody yeah, exactly. would be doing this, you know. Um, even if yeah. you'd ask me, it's amazing. Even, yeah, even if you'd ask me, like we have Josh, who's over at um, Salesforce, and you know, and also on OS. Oh, what's Josh's last name? I'm right. Stick myself um, for that, but it, yeah, there's Simmons, that Simmons, actually, yeah. when I go back to this this rise of the end user participation in on that. So we who have been in vendors that have had huge open source um, leanings have teams of people um, doing this. And um, and I think one of the things, what I'm so grateful for you coming here today is um, being able to have this conversation. It may not be hallway, like at conferences where we share yeah. um, our best practices and our lessons learned and what we're doing. Um, and that's what the open source summit would have given us in Europe. And you know, had we been able to, to to meet there and have this conversation and create yeah. a space for that. But the the sharing of this information um, through conversations like this and building awareness of the need for um, having these um, safety nets and practices and processes and policies in place um, as new companies um, emerge with their own open source ones so that it's more than just talking about making sure that there's open governance and the right license is picked and that there isn't contributor letter. All yeah. of these things are incredibly important as well. But this yeah. is the other, other side of the coin and I'm glad you brought up chaos, but this, the idea of ensuring the safety and, 
and the sustainability and the health of a community is almost um, as important to getting those innovations and in, in technology in out there in the open. Um, and ha I think I think sustainability is also the thing. It's like if you have an unhealthy um, community, that community will not be sustainable um, over time. And yeah. As it matures, yeah. people will leave it. Um, and I think we've been really um, blessed in some ways with, um, like for myself, becoming um, to the Python community and the Django community and the XML community in the early days um, and having the experience of they may have been benevolent benevolent dictators for life, some of the roles that people were in, but folks like Guido and others were um, amazing at um, sharing, um, sharing the spaces um, and creating the space for these conversations. And I think that's what that's um, creating spaces to continue to have these conversations, um, whether they're virtually um, or in person and sharing the lessons learned and the stories. And what I'd love to do is have something like get the uh, the Apple and the Salesforce and the and the vendor OSPOs together and the Linux Foundation does some of that work, but I think there's there's more to be done um, to share um, the best practices and, and like you've done with this blog post which caught my eye because there aren't that many that go into this detail on this aspect so it was really great to see it and yeah. um, to have it here for us um, and I don't worry I will put the link in the chat um, and and on, on the video here so everybody can find it. And as well as to the templates that you've created here, because I think that's actually one of the best things we can do is um, is is document it, um, share the stories, and continue to um, you know raise up the level of how we do this, so that someone coming with a new project or a, a company coming for the first time to donate code to um, and put it into an open source repo un understands what it really takes to do it. It's not just marketing and um, it's an, or great technology. It takes a great community yeah. to move these things forward and sustain them. So, do you have yeah. any final yeah. words of, of wisdom that you can impart on us about you know, how we can ensure you know, a high standard of um, safety and, and that's anything that you, you really would like to, to make sure everybody knows and is aware of? I mean, I think you covered collaboration and that deliberate sharing of, of things, you know, if you write, if you create something, you know, put it in a repository and at the Mozilla diversity repository, like I still maintain that. So if anyone wants to improve or uh, contribute those there, um, I guess I just share like my ambition as a closing, you know, um, we keep hearing like open source is less diverse than tech overall, which always gets me right in the heart. And I feel like a lot of that uh, it centralizes around whether or not people feel included and safe. And I think that the potential is for the technology we're building for our customers for innovation that, you know, we actually become a more diverse and inclusive space for building technology through activities like this. And that, you know, anything is possible. So I feel like this is um, people taking care and investing here is is a great thing for all of us. I think you're absolutely spot on there. I think the move. Um in this you know weird covid world that we're in that's so virtual where you're sitting in your car i'm sitting in my kitchen um, but it also opens up and democratizes the access to participation in our communities and okay. if we have these um, ladders um, for contribution and participation and these safety nets in um, we we should be able to really broaden the reach of our communities and the people who could be included in them and should be included in them and the voices that we hear we hear um, uh, on not just on the virtual stages, but in um, our, our community Slack channels and IRCs yep. and everywhere else. Uh, yep. I think we're at an interesting time where um, the technology is broadening um, the access to participate. Yeah. But it also it makes it easy to violate um, the safety rules and the participation rules. So there's some vigilance there and some systems that we need to continue to put in place and continue to work on together. So um, yeah. I'm totally grateful for you taking the time today to just do this for, and for taking the, all the work that you did at Mozilla, bringing it to Microsoft and bringing it um, there. It, that's, I, I can't wait to, to work with you more. You're gonna you know, have a great time over there. There's some wonderful people. Um, that's and, so very fortunate. Thank you. 
yeah, look, I look forward to collaborating with you and 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 bringing the OSPO folks from from IBM and Red Hat together and and um, and maybe having sort of a, a a sharing between vendors and end users um, who are saying be I'd be curious to see is how that difference differentiates too, you know, from their perspective. Yep. So probably we'll have to get um, the folks from OSI and other places um, on um, sometime soon and maybe have a, a, a broader conversation. So that sounds that's, great. Yeah, yeah we, we could do that. We can do that on a Friday from your car, from my kitchen, from the oh, yeah. or from the yeah. coffee shop that they're sitting in. Um, yeah. so there's lots more to explore here. So thank you so much for coming yeah. today. Thanks so much. And thanks for dreaming with me. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's a dream that, that we can fulfill. Yeah. Thank All you right. so much. Take care. Have a safe drive. Um, thank you for pulling over wherever you were. And, um, oh, thanks for <laughs> taking me as I am. <laughs> appreciate it. Take care. Be Bye. Safe.